All right, guys. Uh, welcome to this uh, quarter Zoom. We have not as much like uh, releases, I should say. I'm coming out like that's probably going to be early 2021 when we're expecting the hard fork. But we've been doing a lot of stuff under the hood. And I mean, we're pretty deep into Tritium Plus Plus now. Um, I mean, just a little update on the lower level database. I haven't published the new figures yet, but for those of you that have been watching, if you remember the last test, we were hitting 150,000 reads per second and 100,000 writes per second. I have since gotten it up to 450,000 reads per second and close to 200, 250,000 writes per second. So um, pretty much a triple on read capacity and a double on write capacity. And that's just by switching from using standard streams, um, you know, file streams to actually memory mapping. Um, I stayed away from memory mapping for most of the development of it because I felt like it was kind of a cheaper way because I knew it would give me performance improvements. So I wanted to just get it as fast as I possibly could and also have like a necessity for it. And the reason that I decided to finally go to memory mapping is under my uh, really heavy duty load tests. I'm talking like probably terabyte databases, um, 300 million keys, um, but each one of the data records are like 128 bytes. So I mean, if you're looking at like a normal blockchain application, I mean, you're looking at least probably five, 10 kilobytes on average. So, you know, 100 million times, you know, a kilobyte, that's, <laughs> you know, 100, 100 gigabytes, you know, 10 kilobytes, that's a terabyte, right? So uh, very, 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 very large database capacities. It remains constant time until I actually started running into paging issues from the operating system. Um, because of the way that you, um, an F stream basically doesn't put priorities to the operating system to tell it, hey, don't evict this page once you know I've written to it. Um, so I had to go to memory mapping because I needed to kind of control more what was going on under the operating system. Um, and it was it was difficult to not <laughs> go into making file systems on our operating system just yet. But I was, I was tempted. I was like, okay, well, I have to go lower and this is the only place I can go. But memory mapping ended up doing really well because it's it's designed more for like reading pages directly off a disk. Um, F streams, you know, are they do still read on a page level, but they, it's not the same way that memory mapping works. Uh, the operating system is constantly fetching those pages, especially you can send and signal it to say, hey, I want you to keep these pages or I want you to optimize it for random accesses and things like that. And so that ended up giving us um, a really significant, that re, it pretty much maintained the constant time because what would happen is when I'd get the database to like 200 million keys, um, I'd run out of page page memory, right? And then the page eviction, the way that the operating system was evicting the pages out from me, it was causing us to probably lose about, you know, half the processing. So, I mean, I'd read like 80,000, you know, writing like 30 to 50,000. Um, so, you know, when I went to memory mapping, it continued to just remain, you know, 400, 450,000, which has been really, really, really awesome. Um, so it's, it's faster now. It's still really constant time. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, it, it covers a lot of what we need. Like we're most likely not going to be looking at data sets that are in the billions of keys, but I wanted to test it way higher than that uh, to make sure that everything remained constant time. And I, you know, like I went down to every little dirty detail on it. It's, it's good. Like, so then um, that's been really a lot of what I've been spending time on squeezing these little performance optimizations out of and making it also extremely extensible um, so that, you know, we're, we're working on providing it as a, I'm calling it NDB, Nexus Database. And um, it's going to be a, a sharding database. So interesting enough, getting into the memory mapping, it just all of a sudden was like, oh, wait, the way I designed this entire thing, it's like, you know, maybe a couple more functions to add sharding. <laughs> I'm like, well okay, I'm going to do it. It's just like, might as well. So I'm actually, I'm on my code level, like I'm actually developing like some basic sharding algorithms for the lower level database that basically uses hash maps to do the sharding. Um, and so that's actually potentially, we're probably not going to move that on production on this next hard fork, probably the hard fork after that, just you, to have- You just effort. want to explain what sharding is for those that sharding don't know. Sharding is breaking the data to. set. Yeah, yeah. Sharding is breaking the data set into subsets of it, right? So right now you have to have every block in the blockchain and every transaction in the blockchain in order to sync your node, right? Um, what sharding will actually do is it'll say, okay, well, if there's 10 shards, then everybody only needs one tenth of the blockchain, right? So it's gonna drastically reduce. So if we had 10 shards, 10 gigabyte blockchain, your disk requirement to run a full node, this is the thing, you're still running a full node, would be you know one gigabyte. 
So you basically, you'll have a little bit slower processing if you don't have lower ca or local caches of those you know, data. Let's say you're processing a transaction that you don't have the dependent transaction for. You're going to have to access another one of their shards. But the way that I'm designing with a lower level database is it's all through the same common interface. So you will be reading a key like it exists on your computer, but what the lower level database is going to be doing is saying, okay, is it in my memory? No. Is it on my disk? No. Okay. Then I'm going to check another shard, right? And so what that does is that it's a huge step towards like having, you know, longevity and the scaling because, you know, even getting the lower level database up to billions of keys, right? I mean, we're talking about terabytes of disk usage and it's just, that's not going to work for people, you know, <laughs> in the future, which is what part of the 3DC is doing is this creating sharding, right? So there's two types of sharding. There's data sharding and there's process sharding. So this isn't going to be process sharding. Process sharding is a lot more difficult to do and we have to build, you know, the L1 and L2 layers really to process sharding uh, but what we're doing on this one uh, for Tritium plus plus which will probably be on the later Tritium plus plus updates is an optional uh, data sharding mode which means you know if you want to save some disk space and you want to start playing around with sharded mode and kind of you know help debug it and test performance and stuff you'll be able to do that so you'll have kind of three classifications of nodes you'll have a full node which has everything the whole entire data set then you'll have a sharded node which is still a full node but you just don't have all of that data on your local disk and then you have the client node, which is what the mobile wallets run. And that only has the sig chain and block headers that you require, right? So um, that's been really cool to see kind of how it all just kind of materialized. <laughs> you know, you, I've been diving deep into like just squeezing more and more performance out of this thing and like literally going to massive data sets, which, um, you know, I mean, the, the speeds that we've been able to maintain with such massive data sets is just really, it's really been impressive to me. Like I've been really, very proud of it. It's a really important foundational element for, you know, not just Tritium and Nexus, but like the internet in general. I mean, if anybody saw the tweet, there was somebody that was already interested in uh, basically getting involved um, and using it. So that's basically the data sharding is going to come before production on the network through a, a software I'm developing called NDB. And it's going to be a basic RESTful API database interface. Um, that you'll be able to basically deploy scalable web applications using. Um, and that's really not going to take much time at all because we've already developed the HTTP packet. We've already developed the lower level protocol and, you know, we've got the embedded database storage engine. So I just have to write, you know, a few simple JSON commands um, basically to, you know, create, modify, update, and delete data. And then boom, we have NDB, right? Which will be really good to start seeing that. That's part of our goal of, you know, seeing this technology is a framework for the internet rather than just, you know, blockchain specific niche applications, because that opens you up to just an incredible um, amount of economic potential, right? So on the coding front, that's really what I've been up to. And I'm like, I can finally say, yes, I think it's done. <laughs> Minus like some debugging and I have to do hardening still, which means like I have to just beat it up and try to crash it and try to break it and all that. But like the performance stuff is there. Like it's, it's like I said, we went from 150,000 reads per second to 450,000 reads per second. So if anybody of you are developers or if you kind of understand how it works, when you tweak in and you're doing performance optimizations, I mean, 10% increase is really good. And you're like, yeah, I mean, that's like, uh, it's really a small increase if you think about it. But like in programming, like every little cycle you can squeeze out of it, the better, right? So a 10% increase is a very respectable increase. This is 300%. <laughs> so it's really cool that it just like it just works really really well and that kind of makes sense so it's called the lower level database and the low level protocol right and now we know lxos right instead of llls because you know spade mentioned it sounds you know like not good so i was like okay let's try something else so lx lower level yeah. library lisp um and l4 microkernels x for nexus and then os operating system right so lxos but um, so the lower level database is actually going to be running a lot of the file systems in LXOS. And that's what we're going to be using to manage our nodes. And it's going to be kind of like a, a distributed file system. And you'll see all of this information in the white paper, um, which we're releasing yeah, actually soon. <laughs> um, sooner than soon. <laughs> Um, I'm maybe, kind of segue straight maybe, into that now. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll I'll give you guys a date at the end of it. I mean, but it's like really soon. Like right now, just so that's that's the second part that I've been really focusing a lot of time on this year is really getting the satellites like ready, right? Getting the architecture ready. So we've been making this specification document 
Uh, so this is not like a, a dream document. This is not like a, hey, we want to do this. Like, you know, the Genesis white paper was kind of like ground stations and satellites. Woohoo! You know, that's about all we had figured out on it because the initial satellite pursuit was, you know, through a partnership with Vector, right? Through Galactic Sky. And what they were focusing on was software defined satellites. And we were a use case on it, which is what created the good partnership in the beginning. We all know the story with Vector. But in parallel to all of that, you know, I was looking at it like, okay, well, Galactic Sky is great and all, but we're looking for redundancy and decentralization. So we need to figure out how to decentralize satellites. And so at the time we hired uh, an engineer from Iridium, um, Philip Swayze, who spent a bit of time initially kind of working through that. And I mean, basically his conclusion was, sorry, you can't make satellites decentralized. So, you know, it kind of sat for a while until um, Nathan actually came this year and he came and visited during the, the you know, scandemic and whatever, you know, he needed to get out. And so he came and hung out and he was, he was talking to me about phase ray antennas. And that just opened this whole can of worms, man. <laughs> like, because phase ray antennas, uh, they have two really important properties. The first property is they, um, allow you to create really high gains, right? Um, while being very small. So a dish, if you've ever seen those satellite dishes, those are really high gain, right? But you have to physically point it, right? Or a Yagi antenna, actually, oh, I think it's in the garage. I could show you guys a Yagi antenna. It's like those those old uh, TV antennas, you know, your old TV antennas with the rods and then they have all those other cross lines. The reason that there's all those cross links is those are actual resonances of the wavelength, right? So the Yagi antenna actually creates this resonance, which gets you a higher gain, right? Uh, but phase ray antennas, they actually can stay be, you know, this big, really. Um, it really, the size of them is dependent on your wavelength, right? How high your frequency is. So if you're using a really low frequency, um, the phase ray antennas are going to be big because each element has to be one half of the wavelength. But we're using 5.8 gigahertz. So ours should be fairly small. Um, and what they do is they can actually point without having to physically move. They use interference patterns to basically point this beam, right? And then the second um, design you know, requirement or what really provides us a lot of benefit from using those too is um, if I'm trying to sniff your packets, like, you know, I go near your house, I can start sniffing your packets on your home Wi-Fi, and then I can use those to, you know, hack your Wi-Fi by sending the auth packets to your access point, which kicks you guys off while I'm sniffing your packets, and then I catch your three-way handshake, and then I run it through a dictionary attack, and boom, you know, I got you. And it's really, really quite effective even with new, you know, <laughs> security standards. Um, so you can't do that with phase ray antennas. They actually they create this spill off on the sides that prevents you from being able to eavesdrop on the packets because you're just getting noise, right? So you have to be directly in this beam. And since it's highly directional, right? Um, that means that it, normal antennas are isotropic radiators, right? They go out like in this circular um, emanation pattern. But when you get to really high gain antennas, it kind of goes from isotropic to really, really this super pointed. And that's actually how you measure antenna gain is, you know, how far off of the isotropic radiation is it? Um, so, Phase ray antennas got me into these ISM frequencies and stuff. And then um, that's when I realized like, you know, there's these publicly available frequencies that are used for Wi-Fi and other things that we can actually use. If we have the right antenna gains, um, we could actually get extremely high data rates, actually, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, and so I've actually gone through a lot of the math. Um, and I mean, from what it looks like, the maximum data rate, the absolute maximum based on the frequency and our modulation patterns is 10 gigabits per second per satellite which is, that's like 1.2, 1.5 gigabytes per second download speed, right? It's retarded speeds, right? Um, obviously you're not gonna get that perfectly because you have error and um, you also have signal strength, right? So if your signal's weaker, then you have to basically go down to a lower modulation pattern um, in order to get, you know, the, the packets through. Otherwise you just have nothing but errors, right? So that's the maximum that, and I've derived that from real hardware um, using, you know, real access points as part of the 802.11ax standard. And they're using 1024 quadrature amplitude modulation, which basically you're doing more per wavelength. So at 5.8 billion cycles per second, which is 5.8, you know, gigahertz, you can fit a number of bits in each one of those wavelengths. And when you go to higher modulation patterns, you can fit more bits. So QAM 512, I think, was 10 bits, and QAM 1024 was 11 bits, right? So you basically keep, you, you can continually utilize the wave more effectively. So in this document, like, that's that's what started this whole thing. And then, then it came down to the routing system. And I was like, well, IP is not going to work. <laughs> and then it just came up. I was like, wait, you know, the routing system is just like machine-readable addresses basically putting you towards a locator, so I'm like, why do we need these machine addresses that we have to load up in all of these routers everywhere? Why don't you just point and shoot, right? And that's what kind of began this, this GPS-oriented uh, locator system. 
and so I called up Victor and I was like, dude, I got this idea. You know, I was like, what do you, do you think it's plausible? And then he's like, dude, like that's, this, that, that would work. Like that's exactly what a routing system is, you know? And he's, he's a distinguished uh, engineer from Cisco. He's been around there a long time. He's been actually helping, which is really cool with this document um, and make sure our architecture is really sound. He's done a lot of work with Lisp um, with Dino, actually him and Dino wrote the book on Lisp. Um, the Cisco published it, you know, Lisp. Um, it's a whole book that they actually wrote. Yeah, it was Dino and uh, Victor that wrote it together. So Victor's a really, really good guy, and it's been great to be able to work with him. But he, we actually found some other documents of people that had done similar types of things with these, you know, GPS locator systems. So this entire routing protocol is Lisp, right? It's going to be entirely Lisp. We're not, we're not going to have static IP addresses that change anything. You're gonna, you're basically going to have your constant access point. But the beautiful thing about it being on Lisp is you'll be able to roam between NP or IP, right? So NP is Nexus protocol, and that's our locator addressing system. And then there's IP, which is internet protocol, and that's the old ARPANET DARPA CIA sponsored routing system, right? So what we're able to do now with this new routing system is basically have the stateless system. You have to have some state with the mapping, right? In mapping entries, but I've been designing like this mapping aggregation system with bloom filters and this whole thing we've got like, so this document that's coming out is not a dream document. This is a specification document with mathematical proofs showing you our link budget equation, showing you our data rate saturations based on available hardware, right? And expected receiver sensitivities, um, antenna architecture, mapping architecture, network architecture, and we go into all of the architecture on the operating system as well, how that's going to function. I'm talking about the memory protection, SEL4, file system integrity protection, and then we have a whole section on security precautions. Um, I mean, discussing, you know, all these different things that we can uh, protect against, and then even into the game theory and the economics of the entire system. So this this document is a really, really important document uh, because it really is a culmination of about four years of work. Um, of designing this thing, of dreaming about it. And not just that, but saying, why? Why do we, you know, our original concept of blockchain satellites was we want to be able to provide redundancy for our network. We want our network to be able to have um, protection, you know, in case, you know, internet protocols start starting with us, which by the way, I'm getting net neutrality at my new house. I just moved and I only get 200K per second from any Nexus related node. But if I go to another web server, um, I get, you know, 1.7 megabytes per second, which is what I should be getting. So they're already doing net neutrality. And Microsoft has actually been blacklisting some of our mail servers and stuff too, which is a good sign because that means they're threatened. <laughs> if they were just ignoring us, it, it wouldn't be. But I mean, all of these fears, quote unquote, or I wouldn't even say fears, are just like natural, you know, precautions of, hey, you know, if they can abuse it, they might. Well, guess what? They're abusing it already. So those things like can basically... That was one of the original ideas, right? Is we can't have this disruptive technology without having our own hardware network to run it on, right? We're talking about disrupting the system, but how are we gonna be able to you know, do it if we're still using their physical infrastructure? Um, and so that's where kind of Galactic Sky came around and all of that. But now it's really become something that um, is not just achievable. I mean, the specifications are there, um, the math is there, It it's, completely achievable, but we also have been able to determine um, value propositions. Really important, um, you know, why, why would I put a satellite up? What's the point? Who's gonna own the satellites? How is that all gonna work in the economics? And then how does that tie back into Nexus, right? And that's a really important thing. Cause like, if you think about the internet right now, right? Like the internet's driven a lot by the US dollar, but the US dollar has valuation because people use it to buy and sell oil, right? As part of the, you know, the agreements they have with the petrol dollar and whatever. Nexus is going to be used to pay for economic services in this new economy that we're going to be developing in, you know, low Earth orbit and on Earth, right? But how we're doing it is we're creating these these incentives into the hardware network, right? Uh, Bitcoin miners, ASICs, people go and buy them. Why? Because there's money to be made. You can go mine it, and you can get a direct return on an investment with a time frame that's predictable, mostly. Uh, we're doing the same thing with the, this routing system and with the satellites, so that basically somebody will have an economic incentive to deploy these things. It's no longer going to be 
um, you know, the big companies are the ones that can get in on space. This is going to make it achievable for everyone. And the technology that we're developing is going to make it available with the software defined routing, the operating system. And then that's going to tie in with the consumer hardware too. So it's all going to kind of to combine together and it's this beautiful collage, right, of different technologies, which really is what Nexus is, right? A connection or series of connections linking two or more things, right? computer networks, people, satellites, <laughs> ground stations, yada, yada. So that paper I've been like really pounding. That's what I've been focused primarily on like this month, really. Like I've just been hammering this thing out and making sure our math is correct and, you know, making architectural uh, specification designs. And then another thing that I'm working on too is basically making um, this technology basically protected from other people being able to basically gamify it and steal it. So we have to have like some sort of protection in the patenting system, right? Um, in order for other people to not go and try to patent this out from somebody else. So what we're doing is I'm working right now um, with some patent attorneys to make it an open source patent. So this specification document for one, there's already protections in place um, since we've been publicly disclosing information about this since about May. So it's already protected. We've already got quite a bit of time um, under our belt, but this is gonna be kind of the final, how should I say it? It's gonna be the final nail in that coffin, right? To ensure that we don't ever have to worry about somebody being able to steal this. And we're, we're gonna do it in a global way, right? Like Craig Wright trying to patent blockchain and all this retarded stuff. Like you could get somebody with, you know, some a lot of money that does try to take it. So we're, we're covering that angle as well. And this is kind of starting the foundation of a new open source patenting system, um, which right now it's not gonna be a platform, but developing this with some of these patent attorneys, we're kind of finding a back door into the patent system and how to do it by kind of publishing it into their patenting systems so that anybody that tries to look up a conflict is gonna see a direct conflict. And then we're kind of Google bombing it across many different categories so that um, anytime anybody really types something about satellites and internet, <laughs> Um, our patent application is going to pop up, but it's not going to just be an application. What we're doing is we're, we want it to be a publication in their patenting system, right? That gives them, because that's the first place any patent clerk is going to be looking. They're going to be looking in their own internal database to ensure that there's no conflicts with it, right? So we're getting it published in their system, but then we're canceling the patent application as soon as it's published so that it gets locked into their publication system, but it doesn't actually become an enforceable patent so that we're basically backdooring it into the patent system so that there's going to be no ownership of it but it'll still remain open source and there doesn't have to be you know like hey i own this and then i graciously let people use it and whatever no this protects it even from me being able to to, to own it right like it protects it from everyone right including you know the inventors um, which is what we really want for this to be an open protocol right so this first document is like our specification document really outlining the value propositions um, the economic incentives some of the mathematical equations and model the game theory um, all of the operating system architecture the network architecture um, and also some experimental technologies that we're working on as well um, which include you know some really cool interesting futuristic things that aren't anywhere in production yet but uh, you know, I, I hope it reawakens some people's imaginations too, in a lot of ways, because, you know, that's all about what the future is, is really going to bring in is, you know, innovation and free thinking, but in a way that it, it's best for everyone, right? And that's part of the game theory in this that we're working on is, you know, I've always had the theory that I think a lot of people in the world, um, they're victims of bad game theory in a way, you know, the sociopaths and psychopaths are the ones who rule the world because the game theory supports them, right? If you have empathy, then <laughs> you're not going to take everything from everyone that you possibly can. So you're probably not going to get ahead. Right. And so what we're doing is we're, we're creating, this as a cooperative economy, right? Like Metcalf's law, you know, the value of a telecommunication system is proportional to the square of the participants, or in other words, people cooperating together, multiply value exponentially competition is a linear value creation right like you're 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 putting out products you're improving your products you're selling more products you're marketing that's all linear right it's like you know a cause and effect like the more money you pump into it the more money you get back out of it right with a certain ratio but it, it's still a linear value stream this is going to create exponential value streams because there's going to be multiple ways that that value can be actually realized whether through uh, market movements of the nxs cryptocurrency 
um, changes in the economic value of that specific constellation, changes in the actual cost um, to utilize each satellite, and then also um, by preventing monopolies, right? So we found a way to basically you make it so that if somebody gets too big in the system, what it's going to end up doing is it's going to take away from them. They're, they're only going to be able to re realize profits up to a point in their relation or their relative relation to other nodes in the system. So um, let's say it's a 10% threshold. Um, Verizon comes in and wants to flood, you know, there's a thousand satellites and they flood in a thousand satellites. Um, they'll really only be able to realize profits on a hundred of those, right? Um, the other 900 are going to kind of sit in limbo until the rest of the constellation is able to grow. And you do that through two ways, right? The first way is you have this limit and kind of a sigmoid curve where, you know, up to your point where you're at a, a number of satellites comparatively to somebody else, um, up to that point, you'll get, um, you know, benefit. But then after that point, it's going to pretty much be flatline. Then the second area is you make it difficult for somebody to be able to actually, um, let's say I have a thousand satellites. If I made 10 identities with a hundred satellites versus one identity with a thousand satellites, you've got to make it mathematically so that the thousand satellites with one identity makes more money than the 10 identities with a hundred satellites each, right? So that way you still create an availability for people, but then you disincentivize the spreading out of your satellites to try to, you know, capture a monopoly in another type of way, because you're going to demonetize your profits. The constellations are always going to be growing. So eventually your satellites are going to become accepted. So those, you know, thousand satellites, if you put them in as 10, you're going to end up, yeah, maybe initially you'll make more money, but then it's going to saturate and die off and you'll end up with way less money than you would have made just you know, reducing or putting 100 up and then waiting for the rest of them to grow. So what it's going to do is it's going to incentivize cooperation and it's going to make it so that you benefit, you profit more when everyone else is profiting more. Right? You make it so that you have to grow the system in order for you to grow within the system. Instead of trying to consume the system all as your own, you have to help everybody else be nurtured, right? So those are really important qualities in this, this game theory that we really need because that's, that's something that's really the internet hasn't been able to fully realize is there's really no direct incentives, even the economics of routing packets between different ISPs. Like they only do it as a matter of, um, how should I say it? They do it as kind of like a, Hey, I'll do it for you. If you do it for me, it's an unwritten law. You know, if I stop routing for you, you'll probably stop routing for me. And that's that. And, you know, they don't really have like anything firmly cryptographically authenticated, like the domain name system with ICANN, like is totally corruptible. Like, there's just so many issues with the internet just because of its architecture. And that's where this system comes in to really resolve a lot of those, um, including DDoS attacks. There's a lot of different properties we can actually protect against those things so i imagine this landscape this this new internet protocol is really going to be um it's we're not going to be able to fully imagine how everybody's going to use it but you know getting those five billion extra people on the planet connected to the internet in a way that they don't have to pay another isp fee right by providing these economic incentives and also this reputation routing system where i route for you, you route for me but then we remember that about each other and then, you know, that builds a relationship with nodes in their local area that start servicing for each other and working for each other. And like, it creates the capability for people to just use their standard hardware and provide access for other people and therefore gain access themselves, which really is, you know, fundamental, I think, um, in helping all these 5 billion people get connected because the reason is because of the economics, right? You know, there's not 5 billion people in the world like are in poverty so you know, like why are we going to put isps there why are we going to run fiber optic cables there right there's no money to be made off of them and that's why they're really not connected facebook's trying to resolve that uh, you know issue with you know this facebook phone thing um, but that still is doing it through a linear way right you're you're never going to be able to fully realize it even if you try to do like a universal basic phone and stuff that just you need to provide people more ample opportunities to monetize their hardware and to provide more resources for themselves and then from that then they can start providing more for the people around them right so those are really important qualities of it that i i believe is going to really drive a lot of unique economic characteristics into this system um and it's really a first of its kind and you know combining together all these different disciplines um and basically making it woven together with really all the really important components of a computer you know your operating system um you know your networking um, your security models 
your file system, you know, those things are all going to exist in this. So it's going to be kind of like your own decentralized cloud in a lot of ways, um, you know, for the regular user. But for, you know, other people, it's going to be, you know, new business opportunities for them to start forming satellite cooperatives and all these different things, which I think is really going to open up um, the capability to people, uh, which is really, really, really powerful. So um, I can tell you it's going to be out before the end of the year. Um, you can definitely count on that um, a bit sooner than that. So, <laughs> I mean, keep your eyes peeled. I don't want to say anything now because I feel like it would be like, I guess you guys, you guys are the, like, you know, keeping in on the, like the close details of it all. But like, I feel like I should just not give anybody any more than anybody else. So I'll just say by the end of the year, um, but we're, you know, we're finalizing it right now. Um, and I'm, like I said, I've got patent people in there that are helping make sure that we're not missing any key details and stuff, because this document actually is going to be an, a protection document as well. We're, we're writing it in such a way that it is going to make it very difficult for people to patent it. Um, the reason that we're approaching the getting a publication inside the patent system um, is because they don't always look at, you know, open source sites, or they're not going to look at our website to be like, oh, hey, you know, did Nexus create it first? <laughs> you know, they're going to look at their own system. And so, you know, if it, if we didn't have this publication in their system, we'd basically be having to do, um, like, we have to send emails to people that we ever discovered trying to send, it would just be a bunch of legal work. So this way, we basically lock it into the patenting system, and we lock ourselves out of it and everyone else out of it as well by having that published. Because really, when something becomes published, um, it's now a published document. It's not patentable. You can't patent something that's already publicly available as part of the rules. And that is pretty much that way globally. So we can play on that rule specifically to create this, um, which is really cool. So yeah, that's that's pretty much where I'm at for my stuff. Um, lots going on. A lot of information. <laughs> lots going. You, the paper is about fifty pages. Uh, just about. I made lots of diagrams for you guys, though, so it's super visual. You've been see it's it's visual enough, right, Paul? You've yeah, been checking it's it. really easy to follow as well. I mean, um, yeah. When I started reading, I was concerned that it was going to be too technical. Um, yeah. but, but it's not. I think you've um, you've you've managed to write it in such a way that um, the technical stuff is in there, but um, you know you can get the gist of what's going on, how all the pieces of the puzzle are going to fit together, um, without needing to understand exactly what the hell's going on with the phased array antennas and things things like that. Um, yeah. So I had just a, I'm sure there's plenty of questions that people are going to want to ask. Um, probably not yeah, yeah. now when they've uh, managed to read it themselves, but um, just from what you said this morning, um, there's a lot in that document, and uh, there's a lot more than just the um, the the OS, which you have um, talked a little bit about previously. Um, I think maybe one of the questions that that uh, our community are going to have is um, where the Nexus blockchain fits in specifically to all of that. What are its touch points? What what data is going to either be on chain or what is the communication, you know, the, the actual network going to be used for, what, what are the touch points there? Um, and that goes for the OS as well. I know you've covered some of this. Nexus before, but... drives everything. So like think of Nexus as like the petrol dollar for like the future of the computing economies, right? Think of it as like the currency that's going to power a lot of the, the, the economies of the internet right now. Now imagine the internet right now is about composed of 2 billion people. So now imagine doubling that, <laughs> right? I mean, Nexus is a core fundamental, um, I guess, technology that's going to be capturing a lot of those economic changes. And it's going to be driving these token cooperatives. Um, payments for data is going to be running through Nexus. Nexus is going to be running in everybody's, um, basically on everybody's operating system and using that to authenticate and secure your computer. So Nexus is going to become like, it's its own operating system user space basically and it's going to be providing a lot of that allowing people to enter into peer-to-peer -peer hosting contracts um, and all of this is going to be paid for with nexus right so if somebody wants to host services somebody wants to deploy satellites someone wants to create a cooperative like all of that's going to be done with nexus so it's going to create really strong economics um, towards you know utilization of nexus on top of the whole smart contract stuff. so think of the smart contract the virtual machine 3dc is like sitting on top of this whole thing right this is kind of like the network layer of the Tritium software stack in a lot of ways. 
um, and that drives everything. Um, but you know, the nexus cryptocurrency is fundamental in all of that, right? You get all of this distributed application development framework on top of that, but you, you know, if you don't want to use all, you get the internet too on the foundation of it, right? So it's something that I think, I mean, just ton, just about everyone can relate to, because just about everyone relates to the internet in some way or you know another with being able to communicate with their loved ones or anything else. So I think it's going to really, um, you know, it, it's going to drive a lot of value, I think, to the Nexus cryptocurrency. It's This is going to be the foundation. So if the internet could have a currency, like that's what Nexus will be, but it's not going to be on the capital I internet. It's not going to be as strongly coupled with the capital I internet as it will be with, you know, the Nexus protocol. Okay, so um, Alex OS, I like, the, I like the new name as much. You like that? Than, yeah. Uh, L -L 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 um, yeah yeah well too many l's and spade was like it sounds like loss i'm like okay fair point man. <laughs> like, <laughs> so that ends up just being um part of this uh much larger architecture but yeah. it can it, it will also be able to be used without the rest of that architecture i'm assuming um and this is something that um in a much shorter time frame will be available um to secure IoT devices and things like that. I'm, yeah. I'm assuming that's that's our in, intention for um, yeah. Alex OS is to and start that's how out. We, yeah, that's how we penetrate the markets, right? Because we have the satellite market. Uh, that's going to be pretty easy to capture because there's really not much in there. We've got this whole economic system driving it, right? But in order to get people to actually start using it on the ground and like gaining those benefits of having the same operating system running, which interfaces with everything, um, you know, we want to target, you know, a specific industry that's really like the consumer, the consumer desktop market is not one that I really um, want to be penetrating first. Like we'll get there once we get hypervisors and you can sandbox windows in there and stuff like that. And, you know, that'll be fine. But, you know, we really need like a, a niche market to really hit. And IoT is perfect because it's an emerging industry. The security is atrocious. Like, I mean, I've been I've been talking with you know a lot of cybersecurity people, like in the developing of this architecture um, of the operating system, and also the value proposition for IoT and things, and like getting a lot of really valuable insight into it. But you know, IoT is you know just horrendous for security. And I mean, those Nest thermostats, for instance, like you can, can completely compromise your home network can be compromised from your damn thermostat, you know? <laughs> and then there's another issue with them is you just have this interfacing issue, right? Like you have to have an app for each light bulb in your house, you know, it's just, it's not usable and it's just not very user friendly. So our consumer market is going to be tied in with what we're already providing in the satellite and IOT markets. So that first phase is to cement the operating system out there and start developing some of the initial deployments that we're going to want. Because then when we get to the consumer level and there's enough IOT devices that are starting to come out with LXOS on it, you know, and you get that LXOS smart bulb, you know, then it might make sense to install LXOS on your desktop computer so that you can start running, you know, your smart bulbs or your things like that, or maybe you just want to experiment with it. So like, that's going to kind of be a foundation and it's also going to be another value add to using LXOS is because just like you can develop a little module, you know, the framework will support like, Hey, I'm going to develop a little IOT control interface, right. That embeds directly in with LXOS. So it's a common built into the operating system. And then, you know, file transfers is really important too. Like, I mean, every time I need to send Bitcoin, like I have to go to my phone, copy the address into my Slack to myself, and then I have to copy it from Slack to myself and then my desktop. And then I have to go put it in my wallet. And it's just like, it's a big pain in the butt, right? It just doesn't work very well. Um, and, you know, Apple's tried to do that with AirDrop, but AirDrop doesn't even really work all the time. Like some people are like, oh, AirDrop just doesn't work for me. You know, it's just like, so, you know, this, that's going to be another, so we need kind of that initial deployments, right? Um, you know, ground stations and cube satellites are going to be the main two that run it to start and then IoT, right? And we have some interest from the, the IoT industry, some people that are really, you know, strong leads in that too. So there's a lot of potential, I think, to be getting, um, out into DEF CON more with that. And that's where we focus strategically more on security conferences rather than crypto, just because it means more if you're a speaker. Um, you know, crypto conferences, anyone can buy their way to be the keynote, right? Um, security conferences don't work that way. <laughs> Hackers, you know, have philosophies in a lot of ways. And it's, it's about what you can do, you know, not necessarily about what you can buy. Hackers, hackers don't really, they don't do the money thing as much, you know, they, 
is less, less, less of that, right? So it, it just develops more respect and a better, you know, stronger user base. So that's, we're going to start seeing, you know, more villages, you know, working on LXOS as far as like security assessments and stuff like that in the future. Once we get deeper into the IoT, you know, and then even have, you know, hacking where people can try to hack it and, you know, prove the security properties that we're able to maintain and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's really, it's really come together like in, in a really beautiful way. And like the, the positioning and timing is actually perfect. You know, with IoT, the emergence of micro satellites, nobody's really pulled off software defined satellites. Like Galactic Sky um, from Vector actually got bought by Lockheed Martin. There was actually a big firefight at the end of Vector for those patents. Like, I mean, cause it's never been done before, right? And they thought they had the only way you could patent it, right? But you know, they didn't have what we have, right? So. Thankfully, we're not in any, you know, situation where you could create conflicts, right? That and we're able to actually realize that vision of software defined satellites um, in a way that is practical and easy for people to interface with, right? Um, so, I mean, it's a first of its kind, not just in the, the internet technology, but even the way that we're using these micro satellites and the ISM frequencies and everything like that. So got a really good crew of people that are helping finalize the the document so it's it's looking really good like you know i'm glad to have that feedback from you paul too that it, we did a good job at making it digestible practical pragmatic and also like proving everything we don't make claims without proof <laughs> like you know here's a reference to this material here's data sheets here's specification sheets here's existing hardware not theoretical you know, like this is things that are actually out there and like achievable right now. You know, the only part that's a little bit less of that is the experimental technology section, but that's just in the appendix, just for those that like to get geeky and kind of see where we're envisioning the future, right? Which covers a few different, like, you know, interesting concepts that we're exploring. So, yeah. yeah. I'm hoping what this white paper is going to do is kind of um, solidify the vision that you proposed, uh, what, three years ago now. Um, <clears throat> and flesh out that with the details um, and um, those details are the things that we've either been developing or have been researching over those over the, the last three years and um, you know and then how things such as LO, LO, LXOS fit into that that uh, that wider architecture that was proposed several years ago so I'm hoping it will sort of re-solidify what it is Nexus is trying to achieve um, and add some details, some flesh into what it is we need to achieve in the shorter term yep. in order to build all those layers. So, you know, for example, you know, we've got the towel um, that obviously that needs to be finished, but maybe now people will start to see why um, the data sharding that's proposed for Armin is going to be important because that fits into distributed file system and distributed file system is part of the OS and the OS yeah. is part of and da, 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 and start to go back up the stack and yeah. and hopefully now it'll, it'll it'll add some more color into the 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 pieces that we're you know we're we're working on yeah. right now and the file system too like the LOD file system is going to come probably before the satellites are launched which means that people will be able to start experiencing what it's going to be like before they have to actually deploy it so we're going to have the whole architecture running right in like a you know a, a production level environment before we deploy it on these satellites so you know the the satellite file system is an extension of the ground-based LOD file system right so the LOD file system allows you to just monetize spare disk space you have on your computer so if you you know like so it's what Filecoin is trying to do but they just their architecture and their economics are just not thought out well enough <laughs> and they got way too much money and that's why all these people are like yeah but they raised 500 million dollars and I'm like yeah dude that's your first problem man like I mean dude like we couldn't buy what we've figured out, Paul. Like you can't, we, you can't buy someone what we've had to figure out together. Like, and all these things, like with all the people we've designed this stuff with, like you just can't buy it. You can't. I, I just, I can't quite get my head around Filecoin. Every time I look at it, I just need to slap my forehead because all they've done is monetize uh, IPFS and yep. that was already out there. It's- <laughs> Dude, just, and they pay, they pay out on the fucking Coinbase transactions, man. They have like this weird, like you pay into the, this reserve thing and then get paid out. It's just like, it shows fundamental misunderstanding of like how to properly utilize blockchain, you know? So like, I mean, it, it's just, that's another folly that a lot of projects I've seen do is they're just trying to come up with a new idea so they can have their own coin 
right? And so it's really just like one feature is the whole coin, right? Filecoin, we're going to use files. Like we kind of see it as, well, you know, in order to have a fully functioning globally distributed system that everybody's utilizing, you need to have things that are functional for everybody, which means like some features aren't going to be for everyone. So you need to have a very wide range of features that make it valuable and you know, very useful places in your life, not just things that are, you know, like, of bells and whistles, right? Like, so the LED file system, you know, which is starting really with this uh, data sharding, which, you know, I'm, I'm going to be starting to do experimental shard mode where I'm going to probably by the end of the year, I'll be posting a video. I'll post another video on Twitter as a follow up to my previous video of the LED stats to show that. I just wanted to make sure I had tested every square inch of this thing before I was like, hey, I tripled it again. <laughs> you know, I wanted to make sure I wasn't, I was like, this is really fast. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything stupid, right? Um, and it's it's good, it's solid. So um, I'm gonna do another video on that as a follow-up to kind of help promote the LED and where that's at. And then that's gonna drive probably into, you know, um, once I finish this paper, I'm gonna be back in there until um, the end of the year. So I'll probably be getting a basic, you know, two sharded LED or something working like that, just to show you guys what it looks like. And you'll actually get um, increased capacity that way too. Um, because you know you're gonna have two nodes doing the lifting, right? Because what I really fundamentally ran into is the day, you know, the the disk is only so fast. <laughs> you know, like you can only read so much data, and you can't parallelize disk, right? Well, I've gotten it actually where I can most, like in the reads, like that's that's where I kind of ended up is the multi-threading, which um, I've gotten it actually really really good with like thread contention and stuff. So um, you'll be able to run tons of threads through this thing too. Like usually, like with the current, like the current architecture that's deployed right now if you do one thread it's going to be 150 but then if you add two threads it's going to kind of slow down a little bit right you have lock condition you really kind of just lock at your maximum uh, disk io throughput um, but i've been using like i'm creating like a, a page level locking mechanism where you can lock a certain number of pages within a memory map um, so that you can have more granular locking um, and that's you know and then also reader writer locks so that you know any you know multiple people can read from it from the same time but only one person can write and if somebody's writing everybody else has to wait for them to finish right because a race condition is when you know somebody reads and writes to the same memory location at the same time right that's a race condition and you get undefined behavior from that things just weird things happen so um that you know is going to tie in so that's that's where i'm finalizing it um the led and then the hardening the final hardening to just make sure like you know even under a power failure and things like that um you're not going to have any disk corruption issues which memory mapping um could potentially make that more difficult so that's that's the downside of it so i've programmed it so that you can actually compile it to use streams or memory maps so you can switch between the two so we we can release you know streamed ones for you know like older computers or you know more constrained i don't know if, if we need it. I, i'm assuming like we'll probably be able to use memory mapping most of the time especially we're gonna have to program our own memory mapping in lxos so we'll have full control over that so we'll be able to get like once we have full control over these things you know i can't i can't control what the operating system's choosing to evict out of the cache right the most important thing for it to keep would be the bloom filters but i can't tell it to keep those bloom filters in right so when I can, right, because we're doing the memory mapping ourselves because we're writing the operating system, then we'll be able to optimize it further, right? But so that, that multi-threading is led into the sharding, which I'm gonna show, we'll, you'll be able to basically just have two nodes that are running and they're, basically you can send data to either one of the nodes and you'll be able to read it from either node like it's on that node, but it's just gonna be doing remote LLP lookups between them, right? So you'll just be limited kind of by your bandwidth and you'll probably get a lower throughput on that depending on your latencies and stuff like that. But that's gonna really be a foundational cornerstone to it all. Um, and that'll start with, you know, helping our scaling is Tritium Plus Plus. You know, it gets further along and the blockchain gets bigger and things like that. And, you know, we start pushing that hundred gigabyte level, you know, that's, you know, people will be wanting to shard that, right? So you, know, you can shard it down to 10 shards and then each person only has to have 10 gigabytes. And then obviously there's going to be a bunch of full nodes. So it, it all does like intimately tie together. Like they're all interlinked in multiple ways. Like one thing is mapped to multiple things and those multiple things are mapped back to it. You know, it's, it's really cool how like interdependent and related all of these different technologies are, but like how the time that they're coming out, they're going to start revealing like what it's going to feel like, right? Because when you're using just the LED file system through Nexus, that's the beginning of using LXOS, right? Because LXOS is going to be <laughs> Nexus running, right? And giving you all this other functionality. And then, you know, then you'll start to feel how that feels to then, you know, start adding the satellites in there and all of that. So, yeah, it's really cool. I'm really, 
I, I was not expecting that this year, to be honest. Like we had just been focusing on the Tao. Um, and then, yeah, this whole can of worms just opened up. And then the next thing I knew it, like it was ready, which is really cool. So I'm really excited to be able to share that with you guys. So on the LLD, um, I think we've, um, it would be really cool if we could have that released as its own library. Um, yeah, I'm, the- NDB, NDB, yeah. It's Nexus database or new database or whatever. And that's going to be its own standalone lower level database um, that you'll be able to basically use as a service. It'll be HTTP JSON, kind of like our API, you know, create, read, update, delete type semantics, which is REST, (laughs) representative state transfer, right? So it's going to be a REST API to interact with the data. Um, It's going to start out as this key value and acid, and then eventually potentially we'll get to relational and SQLs and all that stuff to drop in. But yeah, it will be a standalone service. Um, I mean, I'll probably, I can probably do that before the hard pork. I mean, it's all kind of synonymous. Like I just have to add a couple extra little packets and you know, the process. You might just have us to play it because having NDB as a package and having the HTTP interface into it, I mean, that'd be ideal. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if we could package it up with um, an interface that's um, similar to um, um, level DB or, or something that other blockchains are using. Oh, it's already company, there. It's already there. You mean right, so if we could, could standalone lower level library, you mean? Yeah, if we could if we could package it as that along with a uh, white paper explaining how it works. Yeah. And use that as a um, as, uh, as an advertising tool, I guess. But use that as um, you know to be able to say to other blockchains, "Hey, look, we've this is this is what we've developed. You can drop it in now and see what what effect it has on the performance yeah. of your native blockchains." And um, use that just to uh, have a few more eyes oh. on Nexus and do that. through, you know. Komodo's been interested. Um, we've been talking with the Komodo dev team quite a bit. Um, and they actually tweeted a response to our LLD um, tweet. And they said, now this is something we should collaborate on, which last time we talked to them, we kind of dropped off on LLD because they've actually done a bit of database work um, trying to get you know Komodo to start up faster. And I was like, oh, how long did you get it? Like, yeah, we got it done to one minute, man. I was like, oh, ours is one second. They're like, wait, <laughs> how'd you do that? I'm like, Lots of work, bro. <laughs> like two years <laughs> to get that to do that. <laughs> but they're they're really interested. So we have like we have Jacob who wants to use the standalone service oriented NDB mm-hmm. in an actual high scaling web application, which would be really good to get that into production. Which I mean, we could do like an LLL, um, you know, repository, which Bushel was already kind of wanting to yeah. do that. A bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to pull the lower level library. I've wanted to pull it into its own repository anyway. Um, you know, just the basic template repository and stuff like that. And then, um, so we could do that for Komodo to be able to utilize as their own embedded service. And then we could create the NDB on top of that service, right, as another repository um, with just some NDB templates, basically. And then um, Jacob could start using it. And then I think those would be two really good applications of it as like an actual web-based service you know they're going to be using it for session management for a really high load system so i mean if they're talking about like a billion people we could do that <laughs> you know, i'd be like yeah dude you're, you're good all the way up like i'm suspecting high load usually means like a thousand per second 500 per second 400 i mean like wordpress is like a really high volume website and it does like a hundred thousand requests per second you know i mean but we're looking at 450,000 reads per second, which doesn't mean you're going to be able to process 100,000 requests per second. But I mean, based on the way it's looking, like you could probably run a very small server cluster to, to manage this. And that's where the NDB sharding is going to be important because when you create the NDB instance, if you're planning on having like a billion person, whatever, you know, and you want to handle 100,000 transactions or 100,000, you know, requests per second or something, and you have like, let's say, uh, protocol limitations or bandwidth limitations and stuff like that, you shard it out into a four shard network. And then every one of them just basically can get hit round robin style and any one of these shards will be able to access the data. Or before you even make the connection request, you just have your list of nodes and then you hash to find the right node and then make the connection and then boom, you have it, right? So you'll get this automated sharding, basically clustering system. So it's not just like a single shard database, highly efficient constant time, but you can really multiply that out into a a massive server cluster for, you know, really large 
Um, I'm just thinking of this off cuff here. Have you thought about um, how we can build redundancy into that as well? So as well as sharding, I guess at some point, if one yeah, of your shards dies, you're going to be. Yeah, that's 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 the idea is the sharding is you'll set like four shards, right? And then those will each have their own identifier associated with their shard, right? And then when you bring a new node online, it should be just as simple as firing up NDB and then putting in your database identifier or whatever, you know, if you have like a sig chain password, whatever you have is your authentication mechanism. And then boom, that node comes on and then it can automatically be like, oh, hey, you go to shard three because we only have one there, right? Or you could be a backup node for multiple shards or things like that. So yeah, you'll be able to, it's gonna automatically cluster pretty much for you. Like that's part of the concept. It's just like Nexus, you turn it on and it finds everything and it syncs up and everything. The NDB will do the same thing. When you fire up a new node, it's gonna sync up with the data state of the other one if you want to add you know additional redundancy which i think will be something really really valuable for you know developers on the internet definitely um okay i'm just seeing whether there's any questions from anyone um but yeah i just that that just seems like that could be something we could do early in the year is you know package that up and and um because it and have bushel he, he's been in, interested in um helping to tidy up the LLL so that we can decouple it from the rest of our code and, and have it ready. Yeah, we were going to, we were going to just move. I think I like the idea of moving the LOD templates into each according layer. Like if you have inherited templates and then just leave the base templates in there, you know, I like that idea like decoupling. Cause like, I mean, the LLL originally was standalone and then as yeah. we built the Tritium stack, you know, a lot went into the LLL to really get, you know, Tritium to where it needed to be. And yep. so it really has been coupled in LLL Tau for a while. So yeah, that'll be really cool to see that kind of decoupled. And I guess that'll be like, yeah, you'll be able to compile for the LOD service or, you know, you'll still need LLC. And I mean, yeah, I guess you know, probably need LLP too. And then one last thing that's cool too is like the lower level protocol. I'm not writing this in the paper, but this is something I'm going to experiment with. Um, microkernels are all servers, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, because you have the microkernel that has interprocess communication, and so they're all communicating with each other as little servers, right? So they're, you know, micro server, or, sorry, a microkernel has, you know, your file system server and your process server and all these different servers that are all different processes that communicate. The lower level protocol, I'm going to get it down into the API of SEL4 so that we'll basically be able to make a lower level IPC or a low level protocol is gonna literally be a protocol for inter-process communication on the operating system, connecting it all together. And then when it works like that, right? And you already have this kind of like IPC server system, right? Then you can start being, hey, I need to inter-process communicate with something on another physical position, right? Or another computer or something like that. And so like, I, I imagine this thing is kind of like, you normally have like a little operating system with everything isolated inside of it. This is gonna be like, hey, I have my little window into this big place and I can connect with anything I need within it, but I have my own little space within it too, right? And that's where your computer is gonna exist. And the operating system is just what gives you access to that. Um, but it exists outside of your computer. It exists in this whole nexus, which is going to be really cool. So you're going to get redundancy in your file system um, along with, you know, all of these additional, you know, qualities for communication and things like that. So you'll be able to know, hey, I have this sensitive file or a private key or something. I want to store it on a constellation, you know, encrypted, yada, yada. So it's going to be really cool. I'm really excited. <laughs> so um i yeah i guess we've been going for almost an hour now i i, I, I think we should probably just uh yeah you can everyone... your update and kendall and then we'll wrap up and do questions yeah well i think um i think probably everyone at the moment wants to know you know when our next release is coming out and um uh, that's it's it's not that far away it there's a few things that are all kind of tied together um into that release and and the a mobile the mobile um app is kind of key of that um that's in beta testing at the moment um we've got a good little group of people who have been beta testing so um for the last uh, month or so that's that's pretty been my priority has been fixing any issues that have been coming up with that or with light mode client mode light mode are we, are we we're definitely going with light mode now not client mode I think that's the consensus of what everybody decided. Light mode sounds better and it, it, it describes it more accurately. Yeah, I agree. So um, yeah, light mode is, um, is the version where it doesn't need to download the whole blockchain, only the transactions that are relevant to your 
<clears throat> excuse me, uh, relevant to your uh, signature chain and, and the block headers. So um, this is what underpins the mobile app. So we've been fixing some issues with that. Um, that's looking really actually quite solid at the moment. Um, and most of the bugs that are coming. iOS out. too? Do we get iOS? Because iOS was a little wonky. Is it? It's, it's all looking pretty good right now. Good now. Um, awesome. Because that was the toughest one because they stripped our sockets and stuff. Yeah. So um, Ke Kendall has been doing um, a lot of really hardcore work to get the Nexus core running on both iOS and Android. Um, and then once we got it running, then having to battle with what happens when you put the app into the background or turn your phone off. Um, and as we expect to happen, the OS can then, you know, terminate your sockets and close down your, um, you know, all your resources, which that's kind of okay. Um, but we just needed a way to know that that's happening um, so that we can then close things down nicely. And then when you bring your app back in the foreground, we can, you know, open those sockets all back up as they need to. And then you can instantly reconnect to the network and things like that. Um, so there's, you know, been some work done there, um, both in the, the actual iOS app and Android app itself and in the, the core to allow it to come out of that um, sort of background state um, and find or re-establish re its connections um, really quickly. Um, we've got it, it, it's, it's looking pretty nice right now. And I think the bugs that are being raised by the beta testers at the moment are mostly uh, just really simple UI things, you know, just things not refreshing as they should, you know, with like transaction lists not, not refreshing um, often enough and things like that. They, they seem to be um, fairly trivial things for us to fix. So I think we're getting quite close on, on mobile. Um, so assuming that that goes well for the next week or two, I think uh, Kendall wanted to go towards an open beta um, and just get everyone to, to try it. But I think we need to have some consideration about um, having a larger set of people using a code base that's not released yet because that's it's, it requires our, um, you know, it's basically based upon merging branch. So I think internally we need to have some discussions about how many people we're, we're we're comfortable with it have them being using that uh, that branch of the code um other than the mobile i think the things that we're waiting on before we can release in the next hard fork the lrd is kind of done there's, there's there's a little bit of tidying up to do there but not much um in parallel to all this stuff going on i've been working quite a lot on the decks um, that is progressing quite nicely. I think last week I got to a point where I realized it's probably a, a bigger task than I had first envis envisaged, uh, but I've got a pretty good handle on the design for it now. And what I'm hoping we can do is there's a few consensus critical changes that do need to go in to support the decks, mainly uh, to support partial credits um so this would be you know i want to sell a uh, you know, thousand nexus for ten thousand abc coins and somebody only wants to you know trade a smaller portion of that you, um, we need to be able to um partially credit partially sell partially buy um uh, those those dex transactions which are so it's, it's like a partial fulfillment of a contract that's probably the best way to describe it um, so there's a little bit of work we've got to do in the consensus layer to support that. But aside from that, the DEX is entirely API level stuff. There's the, it's, you know, all the, the core fundamental stuff that will drive the DEX is done. And most of it has been there for a very long time. Um, the rest is all in the API layer. So if we get to the point where everything else is kind of finished, but the DEX is not, there's nothing stopping us from releasing uh, our, our hard fork um and releasing the mobile app to go with it and so on and so forth and then just having the decks bolt on later because it'll we'll release the decks as an api but also um a, a module for the desktop wallet just a, a basic ui for the decks as well and those can all just be released at any point in the future um as long as the the foundational work that's the consensus critical stuff is already out there 
it's just reminding me the last thing that it that, that does need to go into it is pooled staking um which i'll give an update on that so i'm reviewing scott's code um there's quite a bit that i have to modify some of it um isn't quite up to the the quality standards that we want so it's not a whole incredible amount of work um architecturally it really is not that big of a modification uh, because the core staking system was really the big <laughs> the big one like getting it working on tritium so that's going to be coming in with this new hard fork and that's where i'm going after i finish this lod stuff so so you guys know my progression i'm getting the multi-threading done on the lod now with the code um, basically making it so that you increase your capacity when you add more threads not decrease it right and i've gotten it pretty pretty decent there right so it, it's it's moving along obviously like it's just implementation final production move right then LOD hardening and then LLP multi-threading. So since I'm getting net neutrality and throttled here at my house, I only get 100K a second. I can't download for shit, right? I mean, it's really, really, really slow to sync even for client mode. So um, I have to multi-thread it because they limit me per connection, right? So I can just, you know, sync off of 10 connections and I'll get the same download speed, you know? So I, I can bypass internet neutrality stuff, but this may help other people that may be getting throttled too. Like I know Windows throttles you too. Like if you don't add it as an exception in Windows Defender, they try to throttle you. Um, CenturyLink is trying to throttle me. Um, so the multi-thread sync is going to make it much, much faster. Right now it's a single threaded sync. So like if you get caught on a bad node, a slow node, it's not really smart enough to be like, hey, this node's slow. I'm going to get to another one this new syncing stuff that I'm going to be doing is going to multi-thread all of that. So, I mean, you should be able to use your full bandwidth really like in some spaces you don't really get your full bandwidth because you're, you require the uplink, which therefore requires read from your, you know, remote node. So having more nodes to sync from is going to make it much faster. And then that ties in with the final, which is pooled staking. So with Tritium plus plus what you're going to be getting is like, this thing's going to be <laughs> way faster because don't forget before I started all this LOD stuff this year, I, I dove into the LOD stuff because I was doing scaling tests and I was hammering this thing. That's where I got up to 10,000 contracts a second. And then it slowed down. Um, you know, it started slowing down as I got to 50, hundred million keys. And I was like, okay, well, I need, <laughs> you know, I mean, I need to do this. Like, I don't want to see this thing slow down if we don't have to have this. Yeah. Um, and so there's, I've gotten massive improvements in the actual scaling capability. Um, let me see. I'm going to mute you, Paul. Um, so I, I've done a lot in the actual ability to scale it. Um, so it's come a really long way. So you're, we're going to be seeing a lot more capacity. I mean, I'd say this thing in its current state with the LED and stuff, I mean, 1,000 contracts a second. It was like not even like like 1% CPU, 2%, right? So it, it's really, 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 really fast. And now it's going to stay fast, right? That's why this LED getting constant time was really important because, you know, as Ethereum adds more transactions, they're actually going to get slower and slower and slower and slower. And that's one reason why the Bitcoin devs were like, oh, hey, you know, block size. Oh, I mean, they were really concerned about the, the size of the data set too, right? You know, you get slower processing, you have more keys. Like level DB, when I have like keys that I set up at the very beginning of the database and then I write 100 billion keys and then I try to read those first keys and in level DB, it does 15,000, right? And low, lower level database does 150,000, still stays that same speed, right? So it maintains itself really fast. So if in Ethereum, let's say there's a contract that has like a value that needs from the beginning of the data set, <laughs> you know, it's going to be really, really slow because it has to read back and sift through all that stuff. So, um, you, so sorry, I got on a tangent, but you're going to get a lot of scaling capabilities. Um, it's going to be much faster. It's going to be a lot more multi-threaded. It's going to be lighter on your hardware. It takes less memory now. Um, it's going to be, you know, handle more longevity, which means, you know, I mean, we could be pushing thousands of transactions a second and nothing's going to implode anytime soon. Um, that's a lot of transactions. That's about what, 86 million a day, <laughs> a thousand per second. Right. So it's a lot, right. So, um, we'll be able to handle really significant volumes, which that's one reason why I went ahead this year, um, to do all this database work because it's not easy to update your database after um, you've already you know, got lots of data. So I wanted to just make sure that we had this done first um, in anticipation of getting a lot more network activity so that we're not going to see any reduced capacity. <coughs> and then you're going to have the the pooled staking, obviously. And then um, 
you know, it's going to be a faster, much, much faster sync too. So those are, those are the, the parts. Just think of it as like this first stage of Tritium++ Plus Plus is really still foundation. Um, I'd say the second phase of Tritium++ Plus Plus is when we're finally out of foundation work. Um, when we're like, we're still built stuff on top of the foundation right now. I mean, it's not like just a foundation, you know, but like we've been spending most of our effort on that foundation. Um, so now I really feel like, cause we, we finished Tritium, like as far as like updates, it was March, end of March, 2020. So we've really only been developing Tritium++ Plus Plus for about seven, eight months now. Eight, nine months, I'd say. About eight, nine months is how long we've really been developing Tritium++. Plus Plus. Um, so this this next one is kind of like our, our final seal. And then the the one after that is where we're adding the augmented contracts and the the DAO, which those are two really big um, features like the, the augmented contracts is literally like, it's going to make us more powerful than Ethereum as far as your, your compat, the complexity that you can program in. So, um, I just wanted to kind of set that expectation for you guys. So, you know, what, what you're, you know, ready to accept. We're probably going to start seeing, I think probably next year, the f first quarter, I guess, you know, don't take that as like a hard timeline. We're not, we're not setting expectations on that. I'm setting the expectations on what to expect for trading plus plus, um, but the timeline, I'd say, yeah, first quarter is what I'm I'm anticipating something around there. And um, mobile wallet could come out before that because all we have to do is just update, you know, some seed nodes. You know, I mean, we already have the mobile wallet running on mainnet right now. So, you know, a lot of the features are, are catching up as they're finishing their their final phase. So it's gonna most likely be kind of like a boom, 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 boom. <laughs> like once once the first one comes out, the rest are just gonna kind of hit right after that right because it's still a little bit foundationy right where there's a lot that's been going on under the surface that you know you guys can't fully see yet and there's just too much that's gone into it right now to be able to just release what we've already built right like some of the other things like the peer-to-peer -peer api the crypto api like all those things are in the merging branch right those haven't been they're not in mainnet right now you can run them on mainnet but it's still test code where right? it's still not fully you know, production ready so um, we haven't really encountered any it, too much of a slowdown from having to let Scott go. So I just wanted to reassure everybody that everything's fine on that front. Um, I mean, honestly, I feel like I've been getting a bit more done now because it's a little less handholding. But, you know, he did do a really good job, like, for up to this point and definitely wanted to express our gratitude for, you know, to having, you know, worked with him. But I definitely think that we are in a better place now, too. So just wanted to reassure everybody on that, that it really hasn't slow down our pooled staking too much. Like, I mean, the code's there. It needs more testing and it needs a review. And that's what I was going to do anyway, <laughs> right after, you know. It's allowed, it's allowed us to start looking at some different developer resources as well. And we've got some people yeah. from the community who have been helping out, who, uh, yeah. you know, can now hopefully come in and fulfill that, that, uh, that void, I guess, uh, left by Scott. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's we've got Glenn Bogarts has been helping quite a bit. He's helping a lot with LXOS right now. Um, Buschel started coming in and volunteering some of his time. He's helping with some of the, the directory structuring, which we want to say thank you to him. That's really cool that you're you're helping out. And then we have Amanda, um, who's I guess we can say Airborne Wookie's daughter. So yeah, Wookie's daughter actually studied computer science and then she just like hit us up and was like, yo, hey, I <laughs> graduated school. Like, do you need an intern? We're like, dude, sure, like try it out. She's been awesome so she's starting to get into she's been helping a lot with the web but she's getting into the api now with paul too so he's got some extra hands on the api which is great um and then i've got glenn i've been kind of taking glenn under my wing and we've been working on the, the lower level you know crappy operating system stuff and all that so like i mean we we're, we're not like short-handed right like and it really like it just kind of comes down to like we have this quality standard we have to keep maintaining and like some people meet it for a while and then they kind of taper off and you know that's just kind of part of life that's what happens you know it's just and we're just we're doing our best to maintain this really high quality between each other even too like you know i mean if i have a bad idea paul's like dude that's a bad idea <laughs> if he has a bad idea i'm like paul that's a bad idea except i'm not as nice as he is <laughs> yeah. true story it's only because i care though <laughs> i just true do that I know. I really, I just care so much, man. Like sometimes like a period in the wrong place. I'm like, dude. Voicemails. Rest in care. Paul, what have you done? I know. What's going on? So like, I mean, we give each other a hard time as developers, but it's good because it always makes sure that we're on our toes and we're always kicking ass and we're always keeping that bar high, right? And we're setting a lot like of security OPSEC standards now, operational security. Like, you know, I mean, we're, 
we're really drilling that forward and just, you know, one step at a time, improve, 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 improve incrementally, right? So it's just part of our incremental improvements. And it kind of came from just my reviewing the code and we just, you know, together didn't feel it was adequate. So that's kind of what ended up happening. But, you know, as one thing goes, more come to fill the space. And so now, you know, like I said, there's two developers kind of coming in in the wake of that and then also helped us you know get a little more budget to christo who's just an amazing developer like <laughs> i mean dude just christo if you're listening to this dude you you rock we love you <laughs> like so like it's been like overall it's been good and i wouldn't say that it's been any setbacks like i said because we're pretty much in the same position where i needed to review the code anyway um and you know i've mostly reviewed it but i'm gonna have to make you know some changes to it and all that but um yeah we're good we're good on that that front so yeah, and I, like I said, I really, uh, the LOD's results have really far beyond exceeded my expectations. Um, <laughs> I mean, even maintaining constant time, 150,000 just was blowing my mind, right? And then when I started getting into just massive data sets, which by the way, I had to buy like four solid state drives because I kept burn, burning them out, man. <laughs> we got like a whole box full of solid state drives. I have to like swap one out after I burn it out like from all the testing, but like, you know, a few drives later, like it's, yeah, it exceeded my expectations. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it provides value in many more ways than one, um, which is really cool. So I have 3% battery. I don't know if we want to wrap up or I can make you the host. I might, I might get lost in a minute. You know, actually, fine. I, I, I've just sent you a message. I, I, I've got a dentist appointment in 10 minutes. I've got to run. Oh, I got 3%. So Kendall, do you want to, do you want to hop in? If you're still here, let me see. We got a, let me see if Kendall's there. I saw him coming in the beginning. He might've hopped off. Yeah, I think. Oh wait, there he is. Here you go. Uh, you can unmute Kendall. Oh wait, lower your hand. Oh, you raised your hand. <laughs> here, I asked you to unmute, bro. You can just unmute now. Has to unmute. Should be able to. Oh, can you hear me now? There we got you. There right. we go. I got a few percent battery, so thank you. That's that's okay. I'll be really quick. So right. I just got I just fixed the Android thing. So um, right. I I worked with Willcat Power, and he's okay. been testing some of these just um, test APKs I've been putting out. So awesome. the issue was in Android eleven. It's not allowing regular HTTP. It's yeah. forcing HTTPS, which is what we, we want. We obviously want to yeah. move over to that, but we're not quite there yet. So um, I found there's there's an option to enable it. So now it's now it's working on the newer like newer new phones. Um, so yeah. that's great. Um, so the issue with Android uh, beforehand was be, uh, so even though I was starting the core on a new thread, that thread, the parent of that thread was still the main activity. And so what I did is I utilized his Android services kind of routine. So now that th new thread is on a services parent instead of the main activity parent. So now no. the, um, so now the core is like actually a service, which is what we wanted, you yes. know, what I wanted to beforehand, but I just didn't have that experience to kind of realize that's where they wanted people to do. But anyway, so it's now, you know, it's now a service. Um, it's, that's really great stuff. I really wish iOS had some of that stuff because yeah. iOS is very like, oh, if you're not, if you're not in the app in the foreground, we will control whether or not it updates and syncs in the background. And so <laughs> yep. so it, it, it's working, it's working on iOS. It's great. It, it, it does, it does sync, but like I said, we don't control that. So, you know, every once in a while, every, you know, a couple times an hour, you'll get a notification saying, oh, it's synced or whatever, but you know, hopefully maybe things change, but we'll see. But and the, the, regardless, the point is, um, it's working. It's working great. I mean, it's we're in light mode. So if you're, you know, if you wake up in the morning, you check your app and then, you know, throughout the day and then at night you open the app, app again, it's going to sync really, really fast. So even if you weren't directly, you know, in a hundred percent sync lockstep the entire day, um, you're going to sync in like 30 seconds or, or, or whatever. Um, so that, that's all fine. So 
So yeah, right now we're just fixing, you know, some of the, some UI stuff. Um, we got a couple of crashes on iOS and Android that we're looking into, but really it's not, it's not, the really is not that much, you know, that we need to do uh, on that, on that front. I mean, you know, yeah, so it'll probably come out before iOS they're suspecting. I mean, there's, I'm sorry, what did you say? You, Droid will probably come out before iOS or we're going to do them at the same time. Uh, I think we can do it at the same time. Okay. Um, yeah, iOS is a little less stable because we don't control the background refresh as much. Yeah. So that's, so that's the most crashes I've seen is I, um, is yeah, it looks like there's something with the shutdown that's, I posted in our core thing or the the bug report. Yeah, and yeah, it, all of them have just been on on shutdown where it's it's locking up some memory uh, yeah. somewhere. But but like I said, it's it's not. This isn't the end of the world, you know. It's yeah, little, little touch ups, little like touches. That's, that's pretty much where we're at with everything. Like pool staking's done, the LODs done, like the DEX is mostly done. Like we have some consensus critical stuff, like. I'm getting close to data sharding and then have to do a little bit of implementation with the multi-threading, but all of the implementation is pretty much done. We're just in the final touches phase where, you know, I mean, if you don't spend the time with the final touches, then things blow up, right? You can make simple little mistakes. So the bulk of everything is done. We're just touching up the little edges on it. So that's why we say we're really close. And then, you know, at the same time, we got the paper coming out this year too. So that's like lots of things are going to be hitting out. So yeah. I'd yeah. So I, um, I think um, expecting an open beta, I, I definitely think that's going to be on the horizon. I might add some more people um, today. Um, but yeah, we, we uh, Paul's got a good point where, you know, we are, we are technically running code that is not on master. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe not have the, entire floodgates, you know, all at once. But, um, but yeah, if you're not already in that uh, group, the beta group and are really, really interested and don't mind, you know, breaking something, <laughs> uh, hit me a message and I'll, I'll get you in there. Um, uh, but yeah, I, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see what Paul's thinking, but um, yeah, I mean, I, ex you know, I expect an open beta, uh, you know, relatively soon. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, that's it. I mean, we, um, we're, we're just, you know, we're just testing, testing, testing. I mean, that's the problem with mobile, you know, mobile stuff is just test forever. Cause there's so many different phones out there, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but Hey, no, we're, we're getting there and it's, um, it's people are having, I mean, I just love seeing like, you know, helping someone and saying, Oh, it's working now. You know, I can check my balance on my phone. I'm like, yes, there you go. Let's go. So, um, you know, it's, it's all good stuff. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much, um, my update and, you know, we'll, we'll let the community know, um, you know, when that open beta is available for everyone to, uh, to try. Cool. Thanks, Kendall. Yeah, no problem. So I think that's like getting on for an hour and a half. We've probably, uh, covered everything we need to at the moment. I'm just going to have a quick just scan to see whether we've got any questions. I don't think we do. Um, so I'm pretty happy to wrap up unless you've got anything else to add, Colin. Colin, where have you gone? Did he leave? He must have run out of battery. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm happy to call it and let's um, let's wrap up there. Um, thank you, everybody, and um, we'll get this uploaded to YouTube just as soon as uh, Zoom has uh, finished processing it. So that should be up later today. Thanks, everyone.